Poetry and Prose Sarah Ballion walked slowly towards the small lake, taking care to avoid treading on the verdant growth where possible. He had tarried here at the shrine too long, delaying his quest in the hope of speaking with the lady. Three days in all and she had not appeared. He was not disappointed. Those who had told him of the shrine said it was rare for Sir Guinevere to appear in these times. Not unknown, but rare. He had hoped that she might bless his quest, but it was not to be. Almost unthinking, he realised he had come to the heart of the shrine, the place where Tancred de Cordefort had poured the true Liao out to consecrate the ground. He stopped to let the feelings wash over him. The sensation was so strong it was almost unbearable. The belief that nothing could deny Dawn's destiny from being fulfilled. The absolute certainty that one day the golden sun would rise over Hope's rest and all of the barons. It felt tangible, close, real, if only he could dedicate himself to it. Unable to resist himself, the knight drew his sword and planted the tip in the ground as he knelt. I swear to you, Sir Guinevere, he whispered to himself, on my virtue as a knight and the virtue of all my house, I will do everything I can to make this dream real. He closed his eyes for a moment, letting the oath bind his soul. There was no one here to see it, and yet he felt witnessed nonetheless. He rose, and feeling a little self-conscious, he returned his sword to his scabbard. Without looking back, he set a swift pace out of the gate, pausing only to pick up his pack. He didn't bother to avoid the flowers underfoot now. They were impossible to avoid, and he was sure in the knowledge they would regrow with the morning sun no matter how many nights trampled them. It was time to return to the quest. He marched quickly away, afraid that if he looked back, his strength might fail him and he would never leave. The serene stillness of the glade watched him depart without saying a word. A lone figure, a single tall, elegant woman dressed in dawnish robes, smiled at him as he left. He didn't notice her, but nor, it seemed, did the fragrant blooms that filled the copse, untouched as they were by the woman's passage. Overview The situation in the barrens remains febrile but muted following recent dramatic events. The slow reality of the situation seems to be sinking into the blood-drenched soil, bringing with it a kind of calm. Questions remain over the fate of the orc sets who call this land home, but one by one those questions are being answered. The process is rarely painless, but it does, at least, seem to be final. Hour by hour, day by day, the Dawnish legacy in the barrens takes root. As the summer solstice arrives, those roots begin to flower. The Towers of Dawn The great fortifications known as the Towers of the Dawn once stood guard over the Dawnish houses that made the barons home. They were destroyed when the Druze betrayed the peace treaty they signed with the Senate and attacked in massive force, easily overrunning the Dawnish positions. The destruction of the Towers of Dawn was one of the most desolate moments in recent Dawnish history. For far too long the Towers of Dawn have been left to lie fallow following their destruction by the Druze. No longer. In the name of glory and our great nation, we must begin accepting proposals for projects to memorialise their loss. CDGV. The Noble Alice de Renard. Dawn. Spring Equinox 386 YE. Upheld. 284 votes for, zero votes against. In the end, the treachery of the Druze was for nothing. The Empire returned to the barons in force, and this time it was the Druze that were routed. With the barons now firmly under Donish control, questions are being asked. What should become of the ruins of the Towers of Dawn? Rebuilding the towers is one option. The foundations of this great fortification are still there, but it would be expensive. In the end, the Donish Assembly gave unanimous support to the proposal by Alice de Renard to ask architects to come forward with ideas. People are soon eager to offer ideas of their own. The idea of being able to create something glorious to replace the Towers of Dawn holds high appeal. The Tombs of Glory Etienne de Maravel proposes to create the Tombs of Glory, 
requiring nine wains of white granite and 27 crowns. Once complete, the Donish Assembly could use a judgment to order the construction of a new tomb for just three wains of white granite and nine crowns. The Tombs of Glory would have their own wiki page outlining the deeds of those who had passed, like the Wintermark Chronicle of Heroes. The Earl of House de Maravel is young and their house is small, just five nobles, but they are not short of ambition. The Earl's wife, Etienne de Maravel, is a sculptor and architect renowned for her beautiful statues and elegant designs. She is known to have travelled widely and to have studied architecture in Holberg and sculpture in Necropolis, where she was tutored by the reclusive highborn artist, Dina of Sanctuary's End. Etienne claims to have been inspired by the wondrous architecture of the Black City. She points out that thousands of glorious Danish folk gave their lives fighting to defend the towers and thousands more died to claim the barons for dawn. Surely it is past time that those heroes had some great symbol to mark their passing. Why not mark their achievements, and not just theirs, but the deeds of those who will follow them? Why not use the foundations of the Towers of the Dawn to create the Tombs of Glory? The proposal is relatively modest, at least initially. The Highborn have their tombs for the dead thrones. She wants to create a cenotaph, an empty tomb, for Roderick the Lame. Etienne discovered that Roderick has no tomb of his own in the necropolis, despite being such a pivotal figure in the history of Dawn. His remains rest beside his wife, the First Empress, but his legacy should not be forgotten and he deserves a monument of his own. Etienne plans to create an empty tomb for the Lame King and carve a statue of him at the entrance. That, however, would just be the start. When other glorious Dawnish nobles pass away, she suggests that the Assembly of Dawn might study their record, and if they find one whose deeds are worthy, they could use a statement to recognise their glorious deeds. If that happens, then Etienne would be only too happy to oversee the construction of a new tomb or cenotaph as appropriate, and to carve a new statue of the fallen hero to mark their achievements. What could be more glorious a final resting place than to sleep in the tombs of glory, next to the last monarch of Dawn? Creating Roderick's tomb is straightforward enough. It would not even need a commission since Etienne proposes to oversee all the work herself with the nation's blessing. It would need just nine wains of white granite and 27 crowns for the work. In place of the Towers of Dawn, Etienne would create the Tombs of Glory. Once complete, the Assembly of Dawn could use a judgment to instruct House de Maravel to prepare a new tomb or cenotaph. Each additional tomb would require just three wains of white granite and nine crowns to build. In effect, the tombs would become an institution equivalent to the Wintermark Chronicle of Heroes, allowing the Donish Assembly to mark the glory of a hero once they have passed. Etienne is quite insistent on that point. You can't possibly have a place in the Tombs of Glory until you are dead. Tombs of Glory. Commission type, Folly. Location, Dawnguard the barons. Cost, nine white granite, 27 crowns in labour. Effect, creates the tombs of glory, allowing the Dawnish assembly to instruct House de Maravel to create a new tomb for a slain Dawnish noble, whose deeds are judged glorious enough to be honoured alongside those of Roderick the Lame. The Gates of Adventure. Christiane proposes to create the Gates of Adventure, requiring 25 white granite, 25 mithril, and 150 crowns. The gates would be a great work, raising the level of investment of every military unit by one for the purposes of undertaking an adventure. The Senate motion could create the position of the Knight of the Gate, who could control which adventures benefit from the gate. A more ambitious project is one put forward by Christiane, a knight-errant associated with House de Lorne. Christiane is a well-regarded knight whose life is spent questing in the barons. While it is true that he has never achieved glory yet, most people agree it is only a matter of time before his deeds become renowned enough to meet the terms of his test of metal, to quest across the barons until his glory has marked the land itself. What Christian would like, and what he argues would be an asset for many Dawnish knights errand, in a similar position to himself, is some aid to make their adventures more glorious. Now that the barons are Dawnish, there is little need of a great fortification at the entrance to the barons. Instead, what is needed is a glorious archway, 
a gate, something inspiring that everyone arriving in the barrens could march through. Thus, he proposes that Dawn commission the Gates of Adventure, a vast arch designed to inspire questing knights and knights errant. It would serve to raise the spirits of those setting out on a quest in the barrens, but the arch could be supplemented with smithies, workshops and other artisans who could help to ensure that glorious knights had everything they needed to support them. It would require a suitable commission, but the Towers of Dawn could be rebuilt to create the Gates of Adventure, a triumphant archway that would inspire knights in their retinues. Once complete, it would serve as a great work, raising the level of investment of every military unit by one for purposes of undertaking an adventure. In addition, Christian proposes that when the Senate authorised the commission, the motion include the creation of the Knight of the Gate, a national position appointed by the Assembly of Dawn. Christian's idea is that the Assembly pick an experienced knight or troubadour who could oversee the gates, providing advice and direction to any knights passing through, pointing them in the direction of glory. The knight would be responsible for the gate, which would allow them to decide which adventures available to Dawnish heroes should benefit from the effects of the gate, and to decide any decisions that came up regarding the gate. Gates of Adventure. Commission type, great work. Location, Dongard, the Barons. Cost, 25 white granite, 25 mithril, 150 crowns in labour. Effect, raises the potential level of investment for all Dawnish military units based in the barons that undertake an adventure. Optional, could create the position of Knight of the Gate to be responsible for the gate. The Knight of the Gate, type, Dawn National Appointment. Appointment, National Assembly. Powers, chooses which adventure actions will benefit from the effects of the Gates of Adventure. Responsibilities, to oversee the Gates of Adventure and support questing knights and knight errants. The Towers of Enchantment. Josephine de Lune seeks to raise the Towers of Enchantment, requiring 60 white granite, 60 mithril, 60 weirwood, and 540 crowns. The Towers would be a college of magic, patronized by four Eternals, Lofir, Maraud, Prospero, and Scythe. Two of these Eternals are currently under enmity. Famously, when the Towers of the Dawn still stood, there were four massive white granite tower keeps. They're gone now. Josephine, the Enchantress Earl of House Dulun, seeks to raise them up once more. However, her idea is not to rebuild the towers as a fortification. She wants them recreated as a new College of Magic. It is a disgrace, says Josephine, that Dawn has no College of Magic. Urizen has the Doyen of the Spires, Verushka has the Icy Crag, and the Brass Coast have the Lyceum, or will do when it emerges from the misty wards protecting it. Dawn's magical traditions are as strong as any nation, if not stronger. Why then is no College of Magic present in Dawn? Rebuilding the Towers of the Dawn is the perfect moment to rectify the omission which is long overdue to be attended to. In Josephine's proposal, each tower keep will be dedicated to the study of one of the four main realms, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. In her view, the two lesser realms don't merit inclusion since they are inherently less glorious than the main realms. The college would be set up so that it could focus efforts to research new magic on the study of a single realm at a time. The idea being that it would research a spring ritual with the help of its patron from the spring realm. Once that ritual is completed, it would then research a summer ritual with the help of its summer patron, then an autumn ritual, and so on, all the way back to spring again, after the fourth ritual was completed. When the towers are directing research towards a project that is part of the current realm, the work would proceed at the rate of 15 ranks of magnitude each season, rather than the normal 10. So far, so good. There are some challenges with Josephine's plan, however. She claims to enjoy excellent relations with the great wizards of the Four Realms, each of whom, she says, stands ready to be a patron of the Towers of Enchantment. Certainly some eternal patron would be beneficial, and if the Towers are to be specialised in all four realms, it would need a patron from each realm, and it does make sense to pick the Eternal most interested in ritual magic from each realm. 
Josephine has spent years on this plan and has an agreement in principle with four Eternals who agreed not just to accept patronage of a Dawnish College of Magic, but just as importantly, to accept each other. Unfortunately, much time has elapsed since then, and two of those Eternals have since fallen under the enmity of the Imperial Conclave. Maraud, the Summer Enchanter, and Prospero, the Golden Prince, could serve as patrons of a college, but it would not be legal to accept the help of Lofir, the Rotlord, the Lady of Spores, or Scathe, the Hag Queen. In theory, the college could be commissioned with the understanding that the Enchantress of Dongard would not draw on the power of any one of the patron Eternals while they were under enmity. The college would still serve, but it wouldn't gain any benefit when working on a ritual of the enmitied realm. Of course, if the Conclave changed the alignment of the Quiet One or the Bitter Tear, then the Enchantress would be free to call on their aid from that season onward. The alternative would be for the Enchantress of Dawn to find a way to reopen the negotiations, looking for an alternative patron for spring and winter that would both agree to help and be acceptable to the other patrons. That is complex and challenging, especially if the Enchanters hope to swap both of these Eternals for a more suitable replacement. Josephine Dulun warns against assuming that any Eternal will do. She claims that each of these Eternals has a grudging respect for the others. They acknowledge each other's mastery of magic. Any alternative would have to be equally palatable to them all. The proposed towers are expensive, but aid is on hand from one source. The weavers of Weirwater are excited about the prospect of the Towers of Enchantment being built and they suggest that each of the four towers would make an excellent residence for one of Dawn's night protectors. Josephine is happy to include their ideas in her proposal, which would mean that each of the night protectors would benefit from their own palatial rooms in the towers, in keeping with their status. In addition, the weavers would provide the night protector with a triumphant blade each year, so that they have a weapon befitting their position. The Towers of Enchantment Commission Type, College of Magic Location, Dongard, the Barons. Cost, 60 white granite, 60 mithril, 60 weirwood, and 540 crowns in labour. Upkeep, standard. Effect, creates a college of magic dedicated to spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Issue, two of the proposed eternal patrons are currently under enmity. Special, includes palatial apartments for the four night protectors and adds a triumphant blade to the regalia. Enchantress of Dawnguard. Type, Dawn National Position. Appointment, Senate Appointment. Powers, choose which rituals are codified by the Towers of Enchantment. Responsibilities, to oversee the Towers and treat with the eternal patrons of the Towers. The Spires of Dusk. Sorosto Kaili Rezia di Tissato, a citizen of the League, has raised the idea of consecrating the Spires of Dusk once more. The Spires were in a poor state of repair, with a grim and foreboding demeanour, but they have since been remodelled. The Assembly of Ambition seeks to consecrate the Towers of Dusk to Ambition, as an effort to restructure them after the Druge occupation, using a dose of True Liao, Sorosto Kaili Rezia di Tissato. Assembly of Ambition, Spring Equinox, 386 YE, upheld with a greater majority, 326 for, 16 against. A year ago, Darian Numbers raised a judgment in the Dawnish Assembly, calling for Truly Ao to be used to consecrate the Spires of Dusk. At the time, it was felt that the Spires might be a poor site to consecrate. They were in a poor state of repair and they were constructed to project Druge power across the barons, to send a clear signal to intimidate everyone who saw them, to remind people of what happens to those who dare to raise a hand against the rightful rulers of the barons. Every part of them resonated with cruelty, misery, and despair. Fortunately, at the same time that the Synod were passing a judgment calling for the fortification to be consecrated, the Senate were approving a plan to completely remodel the fortification. The Druze traps have now been torn out, and the last traces of their power swept clean. In their place, beautiful gardens have been planted, which will soon be filled with black roses. A number of statues are being carved to commemorate the hounds who fell taking the fortification. The motion stopped short of renaming the fortification, but every vestige of the Druze power in the spires is now gone. 
With the work entirely paid for by the castellan of the spiral castle, the spires of dusk are now a lasting memorial to the glory of the lost army and a durable symbol of Dawn's determination to rule the barons. They've become an imposing symbol of imperial rule, sending a clear signal to everyone in the barons that the territory is Dawnish now and for the future. With the work complete, the fortification could now become a fitting site for a consecration to ambition. It would help to boost Dawnish morale in the barons and beyond, and secure their dominion over these lands in perpetuity. Nothing is beyond our reach. We send named priest with a dose of true liao to consecrate the rebuilt spires of dusk. Where they have sown fear, we will make flowers bloom. Synod Mandate, General Assembly. If this mandate is enacted, the Dawnish, especially those Dawnish who dwell in the barons, will be inspired. Their spirits exalted and uplifted. They will be encouraged to seek out new challenges wherever they can find them. And those who take the time to visit the spires will be filled with a profound sense of destiny. Seeing the symbol of Druge power replaced will make them truly believe that nothing is beyond their reach. The effects on the Dawnish people of the Barons will be electrifying. The conquest of the Barons has been the greatest triumph the Dawnish nation has known in centuries, but ambition demands they do more. People will immediately set their sights on the Druge territories that surround the Barons, the forests of Ulnak, the salt flats of Sanath, and the Saran Grave. The Druge have been beaten in the Barons, and the Dawnish drove them from Ossium. But why stop there? Dawn and the Druge have been locked in warfare with each other for longer than either nation can remember. The resulting surge in enthusiasm will immediately increase the number of armies that Dawn can support by one. It will remain raised for as long as the Spires of Dusk remains in Dawnish hands. In addition, if any new Dawnish army is raised at the Spires of Dusk, then the soldiers will be uplifted by the ambitious aura. They will believe that nothing is beyond their reach. They will be eager to take the fight to the Druge, to see the nation destroyed once and for all, and for the rest of the Malum to be liberated, just as the Barons has been. OOC note. Any army raised here will have an option for a powerful quality that supports a conquest of the Malum. The Chapel Perilous. A year ago, the Dawnish travelled to the Barons to consecrate the Shrine of Hope to Ambition. The shrine has seen a regular stream of visitors since then, but its influence has been limited by the ongoing conflict and its unassuming physical presence. The Empire could commission a large structure to enhance the impact of the true aura present. A year ago, the Dawnish took advantage of a large conjunction to travel to the shrine of Ser Guinevere. The stories say that this night was once Sir Galahad, and that they were one of Queen Igraine's four husbands. They took up the mantle of Ser Guinevere after their queen died, and they became the first questing knight to seek glory in the barons. They were buried at the Shrine of Hope, and their ghost haunts the site still. It is said that they can never rest until all the barons is finally Dawnish. The site has always been a regular spot for pilgrimages, and a stopping point for knights questing in the barons. The shrine has held many consecrations over the years. At one point or another, it has benefited variously from the consecrations of ambition, courage, vigilance, loyalty, or wisdom. Now the aura is true, fixed and permanent, powerful and subtle in its influence. By all accounts, it was Tancred de Cordefour who carried out the consecration, placing a true aura of ambition at the site. The flowers that Darian numbers dreamed of grow in great abundance here now. Wild purple iris, interspersed with peonies, lilies, and windflowers of every imaginable colour. There is no order to the flowers. Nobody tends the beds in which they grow. Yet they prosper here still, creating a sight that soothes the most troubled spirit, inspires the weary, and brings hope to those who have lost the will to go on. Brilliant red crocosmia grows next to variegated dahlias and even more exotic blooms to stir even the hardest of hearts. But currently, it is one of the best-kept secrets in the Barrens. If more people knew of the shrine, if more people visited it, then its impact would be more widely felt. That could be achieved relatively easily by building a chapel, a place of sanctuary where people could rest and prepare for their onward journey. It doesn't have to be some grand church or cathedral. That is something that the Assembly could use a judgment to request if they wanted a more ambitious housing for the aura. But a simple folly would suffice. It would turn the trickle of visitors into a flood, 
as people came to experience the serene beauty of the location and experience the ambitious aura. If the Chapel of Hope was built, then it would extend the influence of the true aura to Danish citizens across the territory. Visitors, guided by the ghost of Sir Guinevere, would be encouraged to expand out across the barrens, looking to settle those lands that are unclaimed. Hope's Rest, the Carmine Fields, the Murderdale, as well as those parts of the Bleaks not claimed by the Karas. New Danish settlements would be established, enriching the territory and the imperial coffers in the process. Now that the matter of Dawn's control of the barons is settled, there need be no conflict with the Septs. The barons is a vast open wilderness, waiting to be tamed. There is plenty of room for everyone now that the Black Wind have left and the Vandari are gone. Out of respect for their neighbours' feelings, the Donish would avoid the forests of Pethat and stay well away from the Fangs for the time being. But that still leaves a rich land that could be home to new Donish houses. Gwynev's Dream Commission Type, Folly Location, Hope's Rest, The Barons Cost, 12 white granite, 36 crowns in labour Effect, strengthens the ambitious influence of the true aura of ambition at Hope's Rest encouraging Dawn to claim the barons for themselves. The Orc Septs Much of the Black Wind Sept have departed the barons. Those who remain have settled up the fangs. There is no word from the Karas or the Rahavan at this time. The Great Forest Orcs have been given reassurances by the judgments of the Navarre. With each passing day, the situations in the barons grows clearer. The Black Wind have used the time and freedom granted them by the Danish generals to gather their people and what belongings they can carry and flee the barons. Not all the Black Wind are gone. A small number of them chose to join the Raven at the Fangs rather than suffer the rule of the Druge. Last time the Septs negotiated with the Senate, they had no idea what the outcome of those deliberations was. This time the Great Forest Orcs, many of whom are still walking the trods alongside the Navarre, pass on every detail to keep them all well informed of what has taken place. Raven and Black Wind The Raven are jubilant to hear the motion for their treaty passed, and devastated to hear it was vetoed. The Raven are downcast by the failure to pass the treaty they had arranged with Imperial diplomats. There is great disappointment but little surprise. Their allies at Anvil had repeatedly warned them that the Imperial Senate would not pass a treaty recognising the Black Wind as foreigners, and ceding their regions where they dwelt to them. They pressed their allies to try anyway, claiming they were prepared to accept the bitter pain of failure, but could not accept the hopelessness of failing to try. Even forewarned to see their families, relations and friends condemned to a life of servitude to the Druge in the darkness of the Malam is a bitter pill to swallow. The Rafen gave everything they had to find another way, and it was not enough. While the Senate passed the treaty, the throne chose to veto it at the last moment. Not all of the Black Wind have left. Some have joined the Raven, swelling their numbers considerably. The Raven welcomed them like returning heroes. They may have saved only a tiny fraction of those they sought to rescue from the Druge's tyranny, but every soul is precious. Together, the two groups are frantically trying to arm themselves with what little mithril the mind can produce. They are convinced now it is only a matter of time before the Empire turns on them, and if somehow that fate is averted, then they will certainly be wiped out once the Druze reclaim the barons. Their only hope is to prepare for a war that they have tried again and again to avert. Great Forest Orcs The Navarre had unequivocally sworn their support for the Great Forest Orcs, supported by the Loyalty Assembly. A group of Great Forest Orcs, including Chief Valak, plan to attend Anvil, due to arrive at 8pm on Friday evening. They have invited two named Imperial citizens to meet with them, but are not interested in meeting with Imperial citizens who are not Navarre. For our Empire to offer sanctuary only to those we find convenient is to pretend as compassion while concealing the heart of a coward. We send Bryn Mawr root round with 50 doses of Liao to encourage Navarre to reach out to all who call Pethat their home swearing to protect orc and human alike, regardless of their beliefs. Morena Witherdrose, Navarre Assembly, Spring Equinox, 386 YE, upheld, 
190 votes for, 154 votes against. We have lived alongside the great forest orcs and we consider them family. We will continue to work with them while the Navar still live and breathe, and we send Brynmore Root Round with 50 doses of Liao to ask Navar to look to their loyalty and swear an oath to protect the great forest orcs as though they were our family. Strength to the Navar, strength to the great forest orcs. Bryn Tentfallen, Navar Assembly, Spring Equinox 386YE, upheld 252 votes for, 58 votes against. The Montanans and the Great Forest Orcs are not one and the same. The assurances we extend to the Great Forest Orcs are not appropriate to the Montanians. However, the Montanians are dear to our friends, and their destruction will not benefit the Empire in virtue or in pragmatism. We will not stand idly by if they are threatened. Quiva Tentfallen, Navarre Assembly, Spring Equinox 386YE, upheld 236 votes for, 20 against. The Raven and the Blackwind are not the only septs with concerns. The slaughter of their closest allies, the Montanians, have convinced the great forest orcs that the Empire could not be trusted. The Montanians weren't signatories to the peace treaty with the Empire, but they were explicitly identified in the prologue of the treaty, and that hadn't saved them. The Empire had turned on them and slaughtered them without warning them, the moment it suited them. Why would it be any different for the great forest orcs? In desperation, they sought reassurances from the Navarre that they were not to be next. They are familiar with the hearth magic of oaths, and aware of how much importance the Navarre place on them. A solemn oath to protect them would reassure them that they are not about to suffer the same fate as their allies, the Vandari, the Montanians, and the Black Wind. The Navarre Assembly chose to endorse the mandate presented by Bryn Tenfallen that encouraged the Navarre to swear an oath to protect the great forest orcs as if they were family. Another mandate that would have gone further and explicitly encouraged the Navarre to also swear to protect the surviving Montanians passed, but with a smaller margin, and was not enacted. Instead, the Assembly passed a different statement, defining the Navarre's relationship with the Montanians. The mandate has spread quickly through the Navarre, especially those who dwell near the great forest orcs. Solemn oaths have been sworn, with many choosing the very wording that Cory Wayfarer proposed for the mandate declaring that the Navarre will work with them while the Navarre still live and breathe. If any Navarre had any doubts about the wisdom of swearing an oath to protect the Great Forest Orcs, those doubts are dispelled by the decision of the Loyalty Assembly to enact the mandate. Kellen Embercast employed the eyes of loyalty to encourage the entire nation to swear the oath. Once that happens, more and more Navarre embrace the oath, many choosing to mark it with a tattoo or a brand as is common in the Navarre. By the time of the summer solstice, most of the nation have sworn some form of the oath encouraged by Bryn Tentfallen. It is a powerful oath, and a dangerous one. Oaths are potent and ancient heart magic. Breaking them can have terrible consequences. To swear an oath on your life and on your breath in your body is not something to take lightly. The great forest orcs are reassured. The Empire might break their treaties, but only a fool would break an oath like that. The Great Forest Orcs abandon any plans to flee the Empire, and instead a number of them plan to remain in the Holt of the Oak and the Thimble, and continue to build up the steadings some of their youth have built near the Golden Trees of Seren, the heartwood of the Great Vale. Such plans have reckoned without the Druge, however. Perhaps the enemy have not forgotten or forgiven the Great Forest Orcs for their support of the Empire. The invasion of Theronin is not the first time they have attempted to strike back, to show the world what happens to those who leave the protection of the Druge. Much more likely, this is an attack on the Empire, an attempt to take revenge for the loss of the barons by taking Theronin and claiming valuable resources found there. There's little evidence that they even know for sure that the Great Forest Orcs were here until they encountered them in battle. The Great Forest Orcs are desperate to discuss the situation with the Navarre. Their warriors have fought to delay the Druge, but they have been overwhelmed. Now they are falling back with the Druge hot on their heels. They have sent word that Chief Valak and his companions intend to visit the Navarre camp around 8 o'clock on Friday evening. Still they have much to discuss with their oath-bound allies following the invasion of Terranin and the events within the Barrens. They also intend to stay and participate in songs and stories that evening. They have made it extremely clear that they only wish to talk to the Navarre, with two exceptions. Kenneth the Mummer, 
and Hazalel Pony of the Shattered Tower are welcome to meet with Valak and his companions if they wish. It's not entirely clear why the two individuals have been singled out, but the great forest orcs will be aware of the statement of principle authored by Hazel el Pony and by Kennet. It is not yet clear if they intend to discuss the issue of the treaty that the great forest orcs feel the empire has broken, or the reparations it promised. On the other hand, those of Don and Verushka are particularly warned to keep their distance. Participation Navarre any Navarre character could roleplay having taken the oath to protect the Great Forest Orcs as if they were family. Any Navarre character is free to roleplay that they have personally sworn the oath to treat the Great Forest Orcs as if they were family. Marking the oath with a new tattoo or brand would be an excellent way to bring this decision into play. Alternatively, you may plan to make the oath during the summer solstice, perhaps in the presence of Chief Valak and his companions. The wording of the oath is up to the individual, as always, but there are suggestions here as to what it might include. It would also be an excellent time to seek out a dedication, anointing, or hallow of loyalty, or to ask the guidance of a guide as to whether you should swear the oath or not. Dedication dreams might be an excellent way to explore this in character. Bear in mind, though, that if you swear this oath in character and later break it, you would expect it to have a profound effect on your character. Oaths of such power are not to be entered into lightly. The hearth magic of tattoos has some notes on what might happen if you become forsworn. Imperial legal advice. Official legal advice is that the Empire may not have broken the terms of their treaty with the Great Forest Orcs. There is no outside arbitration. The Great Forest Orcs feel the treaty was broken, but the law does not deal with feelings. It is a matter for the politicians whether the treaty was violated. In the year 381 YE, the Empire signed a peace treaty with the Great Forest Orcs. The terms of the treaty forbids attack on the, each other, and the very first line of the treaty states that the treaty is understood to incorporate the Orcs of the Great Forest, formerly resident in the Baron, together with the humans that the Great Forest recognises as members of their nation. The Great Forest Orcs and the Montanians always believed that the treaty covered them both equally, and they walked the trods together. The Montanians understood that their religious embrace of the false virtue of freedom was not accepted in the Empire, and they took care not to speak of it where Imperial citizens could overhear. It seemed to the Great Forest Orcs that they, and their human allies, had a treaty with the Empire that would protect them both equally. Those assumptions proved groundless, and when the two groups returned to the Barons, the Empire sent an army to attack the Montanians. They weren't taken by surprise, they got warning from somewhere but it was only enough for a few hundred of their number to escape. The elderly and the youngest ran for the safety of the great forest, while the rest gave their lives in a heroic final stand to give them time to get away. This is the context in which the great forest orcs believe the treaty has been breached. However, official legal advice of the Constitutional Court points out that the treaty identifies the Montanians only in so much as it describes them as the humans that the great forest recognize as members of their nation. That could be interpreted to mean that the Montanians were protected, so long as they lived with the Great Forest Orcs as part of their sept. Once they came back to the Barons to return to their old homes in Hope's Rest, they were clearly a different group, distinct and apart from the Great Forest Orcs. They were no longer members of their, the Great Forest Orcs, nation. As such, they were not covered by the treaty, and it was perfectly legal to attack them. From the point of view of imperial law, that interpretation is consistent with the Senate's decision to declare them barbarians. The Great Forest Orcs are unlikely to be receptive to this legal analysis. Their fears that they would be next have been laid to rest by the oaths the Navarre swore. Now the Empire must decide what, if anything, to do about their feelings that the Empire has betrayed the terms of the treaty. Ultimately, that is not something the magistrates can advise on. It is a political matter, not a legal one.